Church, take your Bible and open it with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 15. When you find that, stand with me. Some of you aren't clear on why God gave us fingers, but this morning I want to clear that up. Put your finger in John 15 and then turn back to John 10. You don't have to, though we're going to read it off the monitor, but if you want to have it there in your Bible in front of you, you can. The title of the message today is More in 2024. Read John 10 with me off the monitor, would you please? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Now there's a purpose statement there. We have the purpose statement of the enemy, Satan. He's come to do three things, to, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And then Christ gives his purpose statement. I have come that they may have life and have it more, more abundantly. Now, Father, today we bow our hearts before you, grateful that you're a God of more. We bless your name. Father, we stand in our neediness, ready to receive your sufficiency, as you want to teach us more. Teach us more from your word about you, about ourself, about our walk with you, about how we can honor and glorify you more. So Father, now again, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, our teacher. May we hear and receive all you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated if you would. Today I want us to go back to John 15. Um, as I do, I, I want to take just a moment and say a word about Bible interpretation when you're reading parables. Now the word parable is a compound word of the Greek New Testament. It's a parabole. Para means alongside. Bole means to throw. That's how I learned that Greek word, bolo, to throw. It sounds like a ball, so I know that's how I remembered it. Well, a parabolo means that you take something common and you throw down beside it a spiritual kingdom truth that what you're laying it down beside helps you understand it better. Jesus uses parables all through His ministry, His teaching ministry. He throws down spiritual kingdom things beside the most common of things. Today, one of the most common things in Israel is a vineyard. Everybody, they were everywhere. Everybody had vines they tended and grew. So He's going to throw down biblical truth about a vineyard. And uh, one of the things about a parable is it normally intends to highlight one or two kingdom thoughts. Now one of the problems people get into is they take a parable and they press the, every point of the parable to its extent that they can and they wind up in heresy almost every time. Parables aren't intended to be pressed to the limit. They're intended to be a visual aid to help you get the big picture and understand it. Are we ready? Yes. The big picture in the parable we're going to look today of uh, the vine and the vineyard is the idea of fellowship, abiding, and fruit bearing. The word abide, uh, fruit, is going to be used six times. The word abide, or its derivatives, are going to be used 11 times. So the main idea of this is fellowship, not sonship, fellowship, and fruit bearing. Abiding and bearing fruit. Now, I think we're going to minute, if you would, about that word more. I've been uh, mulling it around a lot these last few days. Think about it with me, if you would. More. Well, there's a lot about that word that we don't know. More than what? More of what? More from what? More could mean you're starting with nothing, and now you've got something. That's more. More could be that you have an abundance of, but God is going to give you more abundance. More. As you think about this year and as you think about your life in the Lord Jesus, I want us to think about that word individually this morning, but I also want to think about it congregationally. What, what, how can my life have more in 2024? How can we as God's people call faith fellowship? How can we receive, but how can we be and do more. Well, in this parable, Jesus gives us great insight uh, about 
fruit bearing and about abiding. Let's take a moment and look at it if we can. I want to read the first three verses thinking about the potential for more. Everybody in this room, no matter your age, no matter your education, no matter your wealth, no matter anything about you, all of us have a potential for more. Look at it when we read the verse three verses of verse of chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the vine, the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. All right, there the, the stage is set. Jesus said, we're talking about something kingdom. I, it's me, I'm the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. That spoke volumes already to us if we'll receive it. It's all set in the spiritual vineyard of a relationship and a, a walking with Jesus where God the Father is overseeing and is ministering to and caring for the rest. Verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Let's take a moment and talk about that potential if we could. John 10 said, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So this morning, no matter who I'm talking to, no matter where you place yourself, if there was some, some standard of measurement of the Christian life, the day I got saved and moving towards Christ's likeness, no matter where you place yourself on that line today, there's more for you. Now, the, the potential of that is seen because God is committed to me. God is committed to you. He is the vine dresser. Sometimes those things that happen in our life, uh, we don't value them. We don't even like them. But we pray prayers like this, always meaning one thing, but we pray prayers like this. God, whatever it takes, get glory out of my life. And we mean that, but we don't either. I may get glory out of my life when I really am, am going well and everything's great. You mean I'm going to go through suffering and you're going to get glory out? I, I don't think I meant that, God. But we pray things. God, get glory out of my life. God, let me be everything you'd have me be. Lord, let me, let me walk in all that Jesus died for me to have and all that Jesus died for me. God, I want to walk in that. And the vine dresser says, I hear you. And it's going to be my pleasure. Who gets the glory at market of a big, glorious harvest of big, ripe, juicy grapes? Nobody stands back and says, ooh, what a vine. Everybody looks at the vine dresser and says, wow, what a master. What a master. We have potential for more because God is committed to you. He's committed to me and it's to his glory when more is true of us. Amen. Notice the process. We're already talking about it a little bit. It's a, there's a twofold work of God we see there in verse 2. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears more fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. Now, there's two things that God does. There's a twofold work that the vine dresser does. They're in the words lift and in the words prune. Now, if you look in verse 2, it says there, um, uh, every branch that does not bear fruit, he... New King James, King James says, takes away. You've probably got, if you've got a center reference Bible or in reference Bible, you, there's a little A or a little 1 there, and you go to the center column, and you look at verse 7, and it says lift. Or down to the bottom, if that's where yours is, it says lift. A-I-R-O, A-I-R-O, A-I-R-O. It means to lift. It means to lift. Now, we talk about lifting, and sometimes it has the idea of getting something away. Sometimes it has the idea of elevating and lifting it. Now, to us today, if uh, you've not been around vines and vineyards and that's not been your experience, it doesn't mean a thing to us to say He lifts. But if we were to go through Israel, go through the Middle East, what you would see in vineyards all over the place, especially at growth seasons of the year, is there's these things that look like a Y that's driven down into the ground. And when a, when a, when a, a branch is getting long and heavy, it'll droop. And it'll get in the dirt. And out on the end where the fruit is born, it's in the dirt. And so to get it more fruitful, he lifts it and he places it on that Y. He gets it out of the dirt and he exposes it to the sun. And that branch bears more fruit. 
So one of the things God does is He lifts us out of that which the enemy would do to steal, kill, and destroy. He lifts us out of that which uh, Satan intends in the world and the flesh intend to use to keep us from bringing greater glory and honor to God. And He lifts us out of that so that we might be exposed more to His Son and more like Christ's likeness. But then he uses the other word there in verse 2. He uses the word prune. And it's the word uh, kataro. We get our word cauterize. And it means to clean. To prune means to clean away the dead. Somebody says, you know, I'm going my, my, to clean up my shrubs. They don't mean they're going to take a washcloth and go out and wash them. What are they going to do? They're going to they're prune them up. They're going to get the dead wood out. They're going to they're gonna shape them up, make them look nice. We clean up stuff all the time. And the idea is that of cleaning it, cleansing it. The Father, the idea of pruning is there in that word. It's a, it is a horticultural word that's understood to mean to, to prune away either dead wood or even live wood that makes the other wood more productive. Now, I, I'm going I'm to tell you this because it, I've been a Christian a long time. I've been a pastor probably 10 years before pruning really hit home to me. I'd go through things in my life that hurt. I'd go through things in my life that were tough. I started saying, God, what's, I, I've not sinned. It's not discipline. Uh, you know, God, it's not that. And I just was as confused as I could be. And then a neighbor of mine wrote a little book called Fruit of the Vine. And I was headed down to, uh, with the kids, we were going down to, uh, what's that park down there? Seguin. New Braunfels, big park, water park. Slitterbond, thank you, are you German? <laughs> Slitterbond. And I just reached, and I, I just reached, I, as a spirit of God, I reached and picked up a little book and threw it in my bag because I knew I was going to be sitting by a lazy river, I named it that for a purpose. I was going to sit by a lazy river and let the kids do. And I, I got there and I pulled that little book out and I began to read it. And it was for me one of those God moments. When I read about pruning, I prayed that prayer. God, get greater glory out of my life. God, get more. I want you to get all from my life you can possibly get. You deserve every ounce of glory that can ever come forth out of a guy named Tony Romans. You deserve every ounce, every smidgen, any way you can. God, you deserve it. And I started reading about pruning and how pruning sometimes feels like discipline. Because God is taking away things. But what he's taking away uh, causes that which is left to be more, more in number, more in quality. And God is committed to you. He's committed to me. He will lift us. He will prune. But the idea of cleansing, we see it in verse 3. You understand which way Jesus means it. Look at verse 3. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. He said, the idea there uh, that the Father is committed, He's going to lift you out of the stuff of the world you had no control over. Uh, you know, the, the, the vine didn't decide to just go. Gravity pulled it down into the dirt. Living in these days, there is a sinful gravity of our flesh that pulls us away from the things of God and towards the things of the world. Uh, many times we find ourselves distant from God, not because we consciously chose to walk away, but because of gravity, the pull, not being uh, uh, careful, not watching. We just drift. We drift. God lifts us up and He frees us from that. But He prunes and He cleanses us. And I don't know about you, but it blesses me deeply to hear again, God is committed to that in me. He is committed to that in you. What potential. What potential. You see, that excludes nobody within the sound of my voice. You may not even be saved yet. You're a wild branch. But this morning, the Father God is ready to save you and to graft you in to the branch of His vineyard, to the vine of the Lord Jesus, that His life might start flowing through you. Maybe you've been on a branch a long time. Maybe you're thick. Man, you, 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 you're, you're thick. That's why I'm not overweight. I've just, I'm a big branch. But listen to me. I don't care where we are in any of that. More potential is ours because the Father is committed to us. 
Number two, let's talk about the promise in verse 4 and 5. It's a parable of promise. The whole, everything about John 15 is a, a promise and a, an encouragement to his people. Look at verse, three, uh, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, he says again, you can do nothing. Now, as we think about it, let's talk first of all about abiding. Now, abiding can be an existential, of just a, a philosophical idea, and it's certainly much, much more than that to us. Jesus is not just talking metaphorically, he's just not talking metaphysically or existentially. He's talking in very practical, it's going to get more practical in a moment, the idea of abiding. But that idea of abiding is important to understand uh, that it's a part of the process that Christ has for us. When he says that we are to abide, it's the word meno, abide, to stay, to reside in a given place. But now, it is a, an adjective that is constitutive imperative. Now, what does that mean? Constitutive, you hear this, constant, it's an ongoing. Imperative means it's command. This is not a passive word. Like, I abide at my house, I abide in my chair. And there's a lot of passivity in that abiding. The idea, a lot of you think, well, I'm saved. I'm, I, I come and I sit down at the church. I abide here on Sunday morning for an hour. I go home and I'm just abiding. And they think abiding in Christ is a passive work that they have no engaging in the process. We're going to see in a moment in the most practical ways is before it's over. Jesus gets around down to the really no nitty gritty with it. But the idea of abiding in Him is the promise that He says when we abide in Him, notice... You will bear fruit. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me. But if you abide in me, and as you abide in me, while you abide in me, you will bear fruit. But again, this idea that I walk out and the only thought I give God is what was at the back door is I walked out of church and got in my car. Now listen, you say, Brother Tony, who are you talking to? A lot of us. A lot of more than you think. We walk out the door, we did our Sunday thing, we did our God thing, we checked that off, and we're done till next Sunday morning about 8 o'clock. And we live the rest of our week on autopilot, or so we think. Listen to me. Nobody ever drifts towards God. Nobody. We only drift away from God. To stay in the stream, to stay headed in the right direction, we have got to be actively involved day by day, moment by moment in the process of abiding. Now, I wasn't sure. I felt like God was just uh, speaking to my heart at the end of the year. I was praying and like there was something really personal for me. And as I was studying this passage and this message and God laid on my heart, I, I came across a quote that was just for me. It was just for me. And the word was this, complacency is the peril of the preacher. Complacency. I'm a blessed man. I, I, live, I live a blessed life. I hope you didn't hear me say I don't have any troubles or trials. I didn't say that. I said in spite of all, I have a, I have a blessed life. It would be, in some ways, it would be easy for me to passively complacency say, I'm going, let's go. And just coast along. Complacency is the peril of the preacher. But it's also the peril of the people. Abiding is active. Well, not only the abiding, look at the abundance in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears notice much fruit. Now the word much is the primary derivative that's used of the word more. It's the same root. It's the idea of increasing amounts. That by the abiding, by the life of the union and communion with me, you'll do more fruit, much and then more. It's going to always be a, a never increasing life of abundance in you and from you is the correlation 
of the fruit bearing of the abundance of God. As a branch, we have the privilege of sharing the life of the vine. And in that privilege is the responsibility to abide and to bear for His glory. But what a privilege to say, I am vitally connected in redemption to Jesus Christ. I am vitally connected in life, in spiritual life, in Him, with Him, through Him, and by Him. But in that vital union, His life flows through me. The fruit of His life is born out on the branches of my life. But with the privilege comes the responsibility to abide and to bear. Let me tell you a story. I've used it before, I'm pretty sure, because it marked me as a young preacher. I was in my first church. I think I'd only been there a couple of weeks. And uh, I got a call that uh, every Monday some of the preachers of the county got together in the county seat town there in, in Big Duran, Oklahoma. And we had a pastor's gathering. And so I started going. I'm a young preacher. I'm trying to, like a puppy, I want to look out of every bowl. And I'm there, and uh, the preachers are there, and they're gathering around. And there's old brother Homer. He passed it out past Caddo Mills out there somewhere and that in the county. And he was retiring. And Brother Homer that morning made a comment. He said, Brother, I'm retiring here in a few days. And he said, I've not baptized anybody in 30 years. And boy, as a young preacher, that, that hit my mind hard. I'm thinking, wow, that, that don't sound right. But other pastors began to come around and put his hands on, oh, Brother Homer, but bless God, you've been faithful. Bless God, you've been faithful. I'm thinking, well, okay. Brother Homer's been faithful, I guess. And I, I, I left that day with just that dilemma of a young preacher. 30 years without a single baptism. There's other kinds of fruit besides baptisms, but it's certainly one of the fruits of the kingdom of God. And, and I got to John 15. And I read that faithful is not the mark. Fruitful is the mark. If I'm abiding faithfully, I will produce fruit. It's the promise of God. If I'm not bearing fruit, and yet somehow I'm being uh, calmed with the idea, yeah, but I'm faithful. You're being deceived. It's a lie. The enemy's got you. He's stealing, killing, and destroying everything you were intended to be as a branch on the vine. Fruitful is our privilege. And it's the mark. And when we are, the abundance that comes from our life is described as more and then much fruit. Well, now verse 6, there is a painful uh, realization, a painful word. And again, I want to remind you, this is not about sonship. It's about fellowship and fruitfulness. But look at verse 6, and I want you to understand it the way I believe Jesus is saying it to Israel. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and, the gather, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. And they say, Brother, Brother Tony, that's talking about a Christian that withered. No, you say they were cast off before they withered. Backsliding, we would wither on the vine and then cast off. But look at the wording. It's not talking about that at all. It's not talking about backsliding. It's not talking about that at all. It's talking about something very different. Matter of fact, Look at what he says. He says, If anyone does not abide in me, our English verb is, is, it, is understood in the present tense, but cast off as a past tense verb. He has been. He has been. It's that person that wasn't fruitful. He's talking to Israel. Remember how God cries out to Israel as the vine dresser of Israel? Remember in Isaiah 5, 4, God cries out through Isaiah, What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? He's talking about the pain of the, of the vine dresser. The vine has no feelings. The vine has no Nerves in the sense of the, the, the physical plan of the vine. So the vine may never have any disappointment, but the vine dresser would look and he sees a fruitless vineyard. He sees vines 
that are not bearing fruit. He's got to ask himself first, what kind of work have I failed to do? What have I not done to cause these that by nature are to be fruitful that they're not? What blight did I not protect it from? What, what ministry did I not give it that it needed? God calls out to Israel, I have been a faithful vine dresser to you. Now, what's the point of that to us? The point of that to us is to, to know that it pains the heart of God. It pained the heart of God when Israel bore no fruit to Him. And I believe we can understand this morning that it's a pain to the Savior. It's a pain to the Father when we, He looks at us and He says, Tony, what more could I have done? I've saved you. I've washed you clean. I've placed you in connection in life, union and communion with my son, the vine. I, I, I'm working and I'm involved in your life. But you're in, that's where the metaphor breaks down, isn't it? Because I'm not some lifeless vine. I have a will and a choice. And even though the Father may be doing all that He could possibly do, I can still fail to choose to abide, to engage, and to allow God to bear fruit in my life. The past. But then he goes to the picture that, uh, again, is, is there for, for us, but very clear for Israel. They gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now, again, uh, think about this with me for a moment. Think about a vine, vine wood, and here's the point he's making. Vine wood um, is useless for only one of two things. Its purpose is fruit bearing. But if it doesn't bear fruit, the only other purpose is God is to be cut up and become fuel for the fire. Bear fruit or be fuel. You can't, Ezekiel, uh, God said to Israel through Ezekiel 5, 15, 1 through 5, listen to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch which is among the trees of the forest. Is wood taken from it to make an object? No. Or can men make a peg from it and hang any vessel on? No. Instead, it is thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it and the middle is burned. It is useful for, is it useful for any work? No. Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How how much less uh, will it be useful for, many, for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? What's the point? The point is this. We have the privilege, we have the privilege to be fruit bearers. That is the high and holy calling of the vine and the branches is to bear fruit. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. When the lesser, oh, there's, there's some warmth gotten out of it for a moment. There's some warmth that's there as the fire started with it. But would our desire to be to bring the least of our life or the greatest of our life in 2024 to the Savior? He says, there is an abundance in us. The great purpose of your life and mine is glory through fruit bearing. They shall have life and have it more abundantly. Well, let's talk about the praise in verse 7 and 8 and we're done. Look at verse 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and you will be my disciples. Now, I want you to notice again, look over at verse 4 right quick, verse 4 and 5. Get ready to read uh, verse 7, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He abides in me and I in him. So we got the picture, abiding in Jesus and Jesus abiding in us. Now he's going from the existential to the practical. Look at verse 7. Notice the change. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You catch the change? He went from I abide to my word abides. Why would he do that? Why do we see uh, the change? Because abiding is best capsuled in the idea, number one in the outline, of obedience. Listen to me. Is it not the most 
fanatical thing you can imagine. Is it the, the most irrational thing that somebody can be disobeying God, disobeying the Word of God, and they know they are the Spirit of God has convicted them. There's something in their life. There's errors of their life. There's ways they live their life that are contrary to the things of God. And they know that, and they're still not in obedience, but they walk around and say, I'm abiding. I'm abiding. Let's get down. Boy, hurt, preacher. Get down and talk about the prayer promises. Boy, I really want them. I really want Because I'm an abider. Listen to me. No man is an abider without obedience. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. He doesn't stop there. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my commandments and abide in my Father's love. Look at verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus there in that verse changes from the vineyard to a friend and the two analogies of this chapter, the two pictures of this chapter. Listen to me. How deceived can a child of God be to think that obedience is optional while we call ourselves abiding and looking for and anticipating the promises of God of abundance. Jesus got as practical as he could possibly get. He says, you don't understand what abiding is? Maybe before you've read that. If I abide, Lord, I want to abide, God. What does abide mean? How do I, what is abide? How do I abide? Hmm, I wonder. I'm going to buy a book on abiding. I'm going to find a documentary on abiding. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to learn to abide. God, Jesus said, just go to verse 7. Just go to verse 7. Abiding is living in fellowship with Christ that's marked by obedience to Christ. Well, yeah, but you don't understand. Some of that stuff he says, dude, I just don't want to do. I don't understand perfectly. I got some of that stuff myself. But don't deceive yourself and tell yourself you're an abider <coughs> while you're disobedient. Let's be honest about it. We look at the promise of God. We, we see the, the payoff. We see the outcomes of it. Look at verse 8. There's two outcomes that are mentioned in verse 8 and we're done. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be becoming my disciples. Now look at the first part of that verse. The Father is glorified in our fruit bearing. Remember when Jesus is saying that uh, we're to do our, our good works, that others may see it and glorify our Father in heaven. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, in your, good, in your living your life of obedience, in your living your life of, of abiding in Christ, when you live your life like the Savior and you're other oriented and you serve others and you love others and your life is, is being lived like the Savior, Others see that and what they, they don't glorify you. Now they might if they're short-sighted. But those who know better, glorify the Father in heaven. That's our greatest privilege. Also our highest aim, amen. Our, our deepest desire. Listen, tell me, if, if you have no desire to glorify God, talk to me about your salvation. What is it about your life that would cause you to think you've truly been born again by the Spirit of God from above when there's no desire in you for spiritual anything? Don't be deceived. More days. Don't let another year go by in a deception like that. The heart that's been set free and born again by the Spirit of God is a heart that desires the things of God and for the glory of God. Seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness, we'd say. This morning, Nancy and I were reading in Matthew 20, uh, uh, yeah, 21, verse uh, 23, it says that you'll bear fruits of the kingdom. The kingdom has its fruit. My life has its fruit. The Savior has its fruit. The Father has His fruit. Glorify the Father. And then there in the last of the verse, again, uh, there is a, an interpretation of the verb that, that is not wrong, but it's not best. He says, so that you will be my disciples. It's a future tense, becoming my disciples. Now, they're disciples already, right? So what is he saying? I was a disciple the day Jesus saved me. When I got up out of the altar, I'd never borne any fruit yet, but the, fr the, fr the fruit of redemption had been born in me. I'd never done a thing yet. I was already his disciple. But my goal over the years, as yours, I'm sure, is we'll become more better disciples. 
And he says, in the obedience of fruit bearing, you bear more fruit, but you're also becoming the fuller, fruiter version, more fruitful version of a disciple that you can be. Every one of us can be more, better, farther down the road than we are. You see, the idea of discipleship means progress. Moving on, going on. We're here on the first Sunday of a new year, just a week into it. And, and, and already there, there's something about a new year that gives us the opportunity. Um, sometimes the only time we will look back and look forward. And there's just something about it. I believe that's the way God tucked it in the idea of time. There's times when we just uh, have the privilege to look back and to look forward and to begin to think about our lives. The philosopher said the unexamined life isn't worth living. The proverb said it centuries before he was born. Ponder the path of your feet. Ponder the path. Look at how you're walking. Look at how you're living. Think about what last year was. Think about the potential of a year before. But what's it going to mean? What's it going to take? What kind of active involvement am I? do I need to bring to it? For God, who's committed to me, can do in me, for me, and by me, and through me all that is going to be to His glory. But it's going to be to me abundance. Abundance. That they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, maybe as you look back over 2023 and you think of the adjectives that might fit that year, trying, hard, wonderful, blessed, great, fast, <laughs> well, whatever it may be. But I wonder this morning, would the word abundant hang over last year? Abundant? Would you look back and say, man, I had an abundant life last year. Will it hang over 2024? It will if... We abide in the vine. Abiding in obedience, by obedience, through obedience, from obedience. Abiding in Him. Now I want you to think with me again about the idea of fruit, and we're going to close. In, in Christian circles, sometimes if you hang around preachers, you hang around the church, uh, if you're in some of our meetings with uh, team leaders, sometimes somebody uh, may say the word result. Result. That's a word I want to kill this year, like volunteer. It's dead. There's no way a vine can get a result. Robots and machines get results. But to bear fruit, it has to be a living organism that bears fruit. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit bearing fruit in my life as I'm abiding. Jesus talks about the Father's committed to bearing fruit through me as I abide. It takes time to get a harvest. It takes time to bear fruit. It's not automatic. Something that has to happen. But look down at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. And what you ask the Father in my name, He may give it to you. We then talk about that up in verse 8, about prayer and receiving whatever we ask. But it's talking about that union and communion, that walking in a way, in such a way that our wills are surrendered to His will, that our desires are His desires for us. This idea, though, that I, I can claim whatever I pray for, I can claim God's going to do it. Are you abiding? Yeah, I'm abiding. But how about all these places where we're disobeying? Yeah, but that's not abiding. Yes, it is. That's the only thing that's abiding. Obedience. Without obedience, there is no abiding. So we're not talking about results in 2024. We're praying and asking God for fruit. I've prayed it before. I've prayed it already. I'll pray it again this morning out loud for you. Lord God, I pray, get every ounce of fruit out of my life you can possibly get. You deserve every glory that you could possibly get from me. But not only do you deserve it, God, in my heart of hearts, I desire for you to get it knowing full well that I don't know what that means.
Pruning, I'm sure. Lifting up, cleansing, yeah, all of that. But I know too it's going to involve me abiding, walking in obedience, walking in surrender, allowing the precious vine dresser to do his great work against the promise not only that I'm going to have more fruit, but did you notice in verse 16, much fruit and fruit that remains. What does that mean? That's the difference, Brother Chris and I talked about the other day, the difference between fruit and a result. Fruit has seed in it for the next crop. God didn't have to buy seed but once. Once he's bought seed, it comes up. That seed bears fruit that he sells, lives off of, but other goes to seed and he plants it. And seed has life for the next season. Isn't that wonderful? God's already placed in His fruit in our life. I don't know what that next season of my life is going to be or when I'm going to move dead into it, or you either. But I know this, the fruit in me is adequate for the next season when it's God's fruit. Still kill and, remain, still kill and destroy. The world, the flesh, and the devil kill, steal, and destroy. That's, that's all they got. That's all they got. That's all the world can offer you. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. But I, Jesus said, have come that you may have in Him, through Him, and by Him, repenting of your sin, believing on Him as Savior and Lord of your life, receiving Him, surrendering your life and all that you are and ever will be to Him and to be to, to His glory, all that He will help you to become. that they may have life more abundantly. I pray for every one of our families this year that it would be a year marked with abundance. But I pray that as a Faith Fellowship Church, we could look back in December of this year, if Jesus tarries, and we're praying not, but if Jesus tarries, and we have a December of this year, that we'll be able to look back, and we'll be able to look over the year, and there'll be a lot of adjectives I'm sure that'll apply, but one that we'll be able to apply truthfully with integrity is abundance. God lived abundantly in us and among us and through us. He blessed us because we understood that apart from Him, I can do nothing. When you walk in disobedience, you disconnect. You walk away from your connectedness. Obedience keeps me in union and communion. Obedience keeps me allowing the life of the Savior to flow through me. In obedience, I'm abiding. I'm abiding. And all that comes with that, I can anticipate and expect. I can expect 2024 to be truly a year of more, more, more love from you, more love from the Father, more love to you, more service, more ministry, more prayer, more fellowship, more union, more everything, because God, the vine dresser, is at work in us. You see, this morning, I believe He's been at work. Not just going to be in the future, but I believe already He's been working for the last hour. Working around your heart. Maybe He's been doing some pruning this morning and you've had a few ouches in here. Ouch. Ouch. That's not because He hates you, because He's trying to hurt you. He's loving you. And He's pruning you. That you can do the very thing this morning you desire, and that's you bring forth fruit or more fruit or much fruit, and it'll be fruit that remains. Maybe I've been talking to somebody. You have to say, Preacher, I, I can't say the life of Jesus. Uh, I'm not connected. I'm, I've never accepted Christ as Savior in order of my life. But I, I'm trying hard to be a good person. I'm trying to be religious. I'm trying to be moral. You're trying to be the best a lost world can be. Don't you see the problem with that? If you could be it without Christ having to have come to die on Calvary for you to get it, don't you think God would have done it that way? But the fact that Christ had to come and die on Calvary to pay for your sin demonstrates that is the only way for us to be made right and acceptable by the Father. It's through His redemptive work in Christ Jesus. Come to the Father today. Let Him graft you into the vine that is His Son. That His life may begin to flow through you. That out on the branches of your life, fruit, glorious, 
wonderful, spirit-filled, godly kingdom fruit might begin to abound and abide and abound and abide in us. Maybe you're here today, you say, but Tony, I, I've been a member here a while already. What can I do? Join me this morning at the feet of the vine dresser. And let's just surrender our life to Him again. Afresh and anew. Lord, do everything that needs to be done in me. And I know sometimes that may get scary. Sometimes I may get confused. And I may not understand all that. But God, I know you. Calvary forever defines who you are and how much you love me. Calvary is the defining work of God forever. To settle who He is and does He love me. Other circumstances may have its issues and struggles. But because of Calvary, I know who He is. And I know I can trust Him with it. Or do in me whatever it takes to get greater glory from my life and more glory to your Son. In just a moment, we're going to pray and open the altar again, give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe today there's some way that Chris or I can pray with you and to pray for you. We'll be here at the front. We'd love for you to come. We'd be glad to do that if we can. Maybe you just need to come and here in the altar, or maybe there where you sit. You need to respond. The vine dresser has been trying to get your attention this morning. He's been, he's been speaking. You've heard the, the clippers loud and clear as he's tried to cut away at the pruning. But it comes down to your part of abiding in obedience. And this morning, that's going to be your chance, to your opportunity, your place of response. Let's pray about it.